This is West Meadows, and we believe that if you show up consistently, whether on site or online, that you will begin to see the amazing things that God can do in your life and in the lives of those all around you. Good morning. Let's invite everyone to stand. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcome. He has done great things. He has done great chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awaken alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom things it's just for us to be able to enjoy this fellowship you know good morning and welcome we're just so glad you're here today with us for this time that we can just worship as a family just enjoy this communion so join us as we continue proclaiming on who God truly is
Jesus, our Savior. Sing it out. I believe in God, our Father. I believe in Christ, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious light forever seated high and I believe I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. Believe in the name of 
our God is great, and he is also indeed our Savior. And that sacrifice on the cross that Jesus made gave us the privilege and opportunity to call ourselves the children of God. As it says in John 1, verses 12 to 13, it says here, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. As we do communion later on in the service, we just be reminded that the sacrifice that Jesus has made on the cross is not easy. You know, it's just, it's almost beautiful yet romantic that someone who is so big and so high up there, so clean and righteous, chose to sacrifice his own son to give us the privilege, us who is undeserving, us who is clean, sinners, unrighteous, and he chose to give us that privilege to call ourselves our son, his son and daughters. So as we proclaim the victory that we have in Jesus, because we can celebrate that with him, because we are his family. We can celebrate that we are no longer slaves of sin. We're no longer slaves of fear. We're no longer slaves of death. So join us as we proclaim Jesus' life in us, his joy and his grace.
of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Sing it out. I'm no longer chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer I'm no longer I'm no longer, I'm no longer safe to fear. I am a child I'm no longer safe to fear. I am a child Please be seated. We have the privilege to come before a God that that saves us in such a way that we can now call him our father. Let's join together in a conversation with him now as we pray. Please join me. God, we come before you recognizing your goodness, your amazing ability to save. 
the fact that you sent your son to do that. And we praise you for that, for paying a price none of us could have paid and doing it willingly with love at the heart of it, a redemption beyond all understanding so that we can gather together today and praise you, lift up our voices, and in all we do, strive to bring glory to you. God, for those times where we don't succeed in that, we want to repent of that. We want to turn from that to face you again. God, if there's something in our heart, a sin that we're holding tight today, bring it to the forefront of our minds. Take it out of our heart. May we bundle that up and offer it to you because we know that you're a God that can take that from us, that is willing to bear that burden like you did on the cross so that we may enter into that right relationship with you. So God, today, take that from us. Help us to turn wholly again to you. God, we know we are not just the people that are here today, but we are a worldwide people. And when one of us hurts, all of us hurts. And so we, we recognize the, the turmoil in Iran right now. God, we recognize the, the freedom that isn't present for the population there, specifically for the women. God, we know you have a heart for those that are considered the least of these. So may you be a God ever present in that time right now. God, give us hearts to know how to help. Give us hearts to know how to pray. Give us hearts to know how to support those around us who may be feeling it in a greater way. God, we ask for those of us in this room that may be struggling with something, that you would reach in and touch our hearts. God, we can ask all these things because in the end we can yield to you. We can turn all we are, all we have, all we desire over to you and say, God, not our will, but your will be done. Take all that I have and use it for your glory. God, may that be our focus today and moving forward. All that we do for your glory. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the portion of our service where we continue worship through giving. And so if you're here on site, feel free to take advantage of the boxes at the back on your way out to drop in your offering there. If you're online, there's a button just above me with all of the available giving options. All of that giving goes towards ministries that we're able to provide here at West Meadows. Saturday is usually not the day that's so packed in this building, but that's what happened this week. We had three events going on here yesterday. We had a men's breakfast in the morning. We had a women's event at night. We had Resurgence, which is a worship gathering group that was here last night worshiping. And so all of that giving allows us to be able to provide new life experiences like all of those for a surrounding area and for all of you here. So we, we just thank you for all of that giving in those ways. But also another way to do that is through Discover West Meadows here. So if you're new to us or you still feel kind of new, Today's the day. Stay after church. Food will be provided. It'll be in the youth room just behind us. The staff would love to share more of the mission and the vision and the values of West Meadows with you so that you can feel more connected to us. But if that's not where you want to be, the welcome desk is right outside there. When we encourage you to go there, we have a gift for you if you're new here with us today. Those are all ways that we get to experience new life here at West Meadows. So here's a few more ways you can do that with us. Coming up this week, we've got an hour of prayer this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Everyone is welcome as our board will lead our church in prayer. If West Meadows is indeed your home church, we'd encourage you to join the church directory. This is a great way for you to stay connected with your fellow churchgoers. Check your inbox or use the Pew Portal to sign up today. Finally, many of our groups are back up and running, like Alpha, Men's, Women's, and Seniors Bible Studies, Ball Hockey, the Grandmas and Gals Prayer Group, and much more. 
In fact, we're even putting together new groups, like two young families life groups and a young adults group for those who are working, seriously dating, married, or you just don't have kids yet. If you're looking to get connected, please visit our website for a full list of our available groups or contact Pastor Mark if you're interested in joining one of the new groups I just mentioned. For more details about anything else, check out our online bulletin. If you're joining us in person, just scan that pew portal on the pew in front of you. Or if you're joining us online, you can access it through the menu above. Here you can find more details, more opportunities you can experience new life and sign up for any of the events I just mentioned. For anything else, you're always welcome to contact the church office. Now, let's hear this week's message. Well, good morning. Welcome to everybody who's joining us on site and online today. We're glad to have you with us as we are into our fourth week of this sermon series. Our fourth leading question we're looking at. these. When we say leading questions, we mean we're, we're looking at the lead-off questions, the first questions that a select individuals in the Bible asked. And as I mentioned, we're into the fourth week. We've talked about the first question God asked, the first question that Jesus asked, the first question that Satan asks. And now today we come to the first question that a person asks in the Bible. And I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts on what that question might be. Am I? I, I thought Phil might know. And indeed, we didn't pre-organize. Yep, Phil tracking with us. There you go. Good job, Phil. Yes. Am I my brother's keeper? The first question they person asked, and they asked it towards God. And this question is asked as sort of the, it's sort of the climactic question in the original sibling rivalry that takes place between the sons of Adam and Eve. Now, if you have a brother or a sister, or if you're a parent and you have more than one child, you may have some idea of what a sibling rivalry looks like already. Uh, Perhaps you have more than one child and they compete for mom's attention. Or they're jealous over which picture gets hung on the fridge or gets hung highest on the fridge. Maybe there's resentment over who got to pick the movie last Friday night and and I didn't get to watch my movie. And it's led to activity and behaviors throughout the week as there's conflict and there's combating that takes place. Nadine and I have three children and I got to say that the rivalry is pretty minimal in, in our household. Now, we have Kaylina, our oldest, and then two boys, Sam and Joshua. And, and they're typical, typical boys. They, they would call each other names on occasion. They, they'd tussle a little bit. They'd argue, nothing, nothing too unusual. You know, back in the time when they were younger, it was, it was debates over, like, who's the better hockey player, you know, Vetchkin or Crosby? Uh, who amongst them was the better hockey player, Sam or Josh? Who got the top bunk? We had bunk beds in their room, and that was a thing that was debated for a while and, and fought over. It brought probably at its worst when they would play Super Smash Brothers, and they would play that video game for hours, and Super Smash Brothers would sometimes go from the TV to the floor at times. <laughs> but for the most part, they got along pretty well, though. They never really lashed out at each other, so I don't think there was too much rivalry there. Although there was the time. Uh, when Sam pushed Josh off the merry go round when it was going really fast, and then Josh's leg got cut underneath, and it kept spinning on his leg and kind of cut it up a little bit. And, and then there was the time that Josh pushed him off the sofa, and then knee dropped on his face and knocked his tooth out. And that was on uh, New Year's Eve as well. Try finding a dentist on New Year's Eve <laughs> for that. There is that. Maybe, maybe there's more going on there than I thought. This is actually therapeutic for me too. We should talk more about this. But, you know, but, but Josh got his in too, because they would start to wrestle, and Josh eventually got a little bigger. Even though he was the younger brother, he got a little bit bigger, and, and, and he even the score over the years. But, you know, typical boy stuff, nothing too serious, typical boy stuff. But here's the thing. If you were to ask them then, and if you would ask them today, are you your brother's keeper? They would say yes. We are. There's, even though there's competition that happens in the past, even though there's moments of jealousy and even periods of resentment that may show up at different times, all that aside, I firmly believe and, and I think solidly believe that they have each other's backs. There's this sense of shared responsibility for each other that they have. The sense of sp- shared responsibility where they care for each other and, and tend to each other's needs as they come up. Now, for some of you, you may be able to relate to some of this, but it didn't stay as just a rivalry in childhood. It actually maybe followed you into adulthood. And as you think about your situation or somebody in your family or a friend that you might know, you might think, you know, I'm not sure if they do have my back. Because that rivalry continued. Because of years of of just real or perceived hurt and anger and jealousy, it brought more harm 
than life. Well, the story that surrounds this question we're going to look at today is found in Genesis chapter 4. And I welcome you to turn to that if you'd like to follow along with the story. Or you can just use the pew portal in front of you and the sermon notes can be found on the website there. And we find that in Genesis 4, it confirms for us that after Adam and Eve's failure in the garden, that sin indeed has entered into the world. And the effects of sin now exist amongst those who are born into sin. And in Genesis 4... As the story opens in Genesis chapter 4, it begins with a happy announcement. It begins with the, first of the very, with the announcement of the very first child born into the world of sin. And we read this. It says, Adam made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain kept the soil. I'm not sure if that's how anybody here has announced the arrival of their son. I have given birth to a man. (laughs) Back then, it was very sentimental, I suppose. Now, the birth of the baby is a special occasion. It's a happy time, no matter what the situation is, but especially so in this case. Because this is not only the very first baby, not just born to Adam and Eve, but the very first baby ever born, but even more special than that. The birth of this child confirms that God has not given up on humanity. It confirms that God's relationship with people, while it has changed because of sin, he has not erased it. And that could be part of what Eve means when she says, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Perhaps she's acknowledging here that God is the author and the sustainer of all life. And even though they have stumbled, even though they have brought sin into the world, even though they have lived in the realities of that, that God is still the sustainer and the provider of good life. Maybe that's what it means. Or it could mean that Eve is thinking back to after they sinned and God pronounced the curses and he said something along the lines of, there's going to be severe pain during childbirth. And oh man, he wasn't kidding. No epidural, no nitrous oxide, and Adam wasn't helpful at all. Just like, breathe, honey. (laughs) Does that even do anything? I'll save it for another day, but I was probably as useful as Adam at the birth of our children. No. And so he was maybe looking back upon this going, he wasn't kidding. With the help of the Lord alone, I you know, brought forth this child. <laughs> I think it's probably the first meaning that she's reflecting and acknowledging that God is the author and the sustainer of life. But even though she went through this difficult challenge in giving birth to the very first child, The pain, as mothers know, the pain is eventually replaced with joy, and it seems like a good idea to have another child, and then she gives birth to Abel. And we're not told too much about these boys, but we know that as they grow, we're not told if there was too much of a rivalry between them. We're just simply told that they had respectable, necessary professions. That Cain, he worked the soil. He would would grow crops, and he would harvest these crops to feed his family. And Abel cared for and raised flocks of sheep. And provided the necessary resources for his family. In some ways, you could look at these guys and go, they are two good old Alberta boys, right? A farmer and a rancher. Loved by mom and dad and loved by God. And we know that they had a relationship with God because they felt a responsibility to him. And they felt reverence for him. We see this in the next verses, in verse 3. Where it says, in the course of time, which means they grew up and became men. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And so Cain became very angry, and his face was downcast. Now, the reason that one was received and one was the other is somewhat shrouded in mystery. It's speculation only as to why this actually took place. Now, some claim that it was because one offered an offering of animals and one was an offering of crops, where one was a blood sacrifice and the other was not. So some people think that's the issue. Most, however, most theologians most would, would say that it was more actually about a matter of the heart. It was more an issue about their heart and attitude of the giver. And this is somewhat backed up when we read into the New Testament about Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, where it says, By faith, Abel brought to God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, Abel brought a better offering than Cain did. How do we understand this? Well, from this, we can, we can kind of understand that Abel's faith made his offering better in form and in posture. 
How do we see that? You see it somewhat in the text in Genesis chapter 4. You see, it says in, in Genesis 4 that Cain brought some of his crops. A very simple, very concise description. He, he's brought some of his crops. And he's not mentioned in Hebrews 11 of having done this out of an act of faith. So he maybe did it out of a sense of just formality. This is what we're supposed to do, so I'll just go through the religious requirements, the dutiful service of just bringing these crops. And it wasn't an act of faith, which means there's a good chance that he harvested his crops and looked after himself, and then out of a sense of duty, gave what he could afford. He, he gave what he could spare out of a sense of duty after he looked after himself. Nothing about that really sounds like faith. But we do have some sense that Abel had a different posture and a different offering. See, not only does Hebrews 11 say that, that faith was part of Abel's offering, but also the text in Genesis 4, as you see there, it says Abel brought some of the first and the best of what he had. He brought the first. Before he had anything else, before he had any extra, before he provided for any of his own needs, he praised and worshiped God with what God had given him. He brought the first, and he brought the best of what he had. That's an act of faith. That's an act of faith. Before he had any extra, he thanked God for what he'd been given, trusting that God would give more. If God gave the first, he will give the rest. And in the future, we would come to see that this is sort of the commandments and this is the sacrificial system that Israel would come to live under when they would come into the promised land. And it's referred to as the first fruits, the giving of first fruits. And it's an act of worship, it's an act of faith as you give the first and the best of what you have, thanking and praising God for what's been given. So let's believe that this is more an aspect of what's going on in their hearts. Where Cain's heart was given out of a sense of duty. But Abel had more of a devoted heart that he gave from. And there's further reason to believe that this is a matter of attitude as well. Because when Cain's offering is rejected, he gets angry and pouty. Now who's he mad at? Is he mad at God for rejecting him? Is he mad at Abel for making him look bad? I thought we were brothers, man. Or maybe he's mad at himself for getting caught cheating God. Or maybe all of the above. We don't know. But what we do know from the next verse is that even though he is sad and downcast and angry, even though God rejected his offering, God does not reject him. God loves him. And God still has a concern for him. And so God goes to him in verse 6. And then it says in verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But, but if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must rule over it, God says to him. You see, Cain's at a crossroads here. One that perhaps we're all familiar with. Because all of us, I think, at some point, in some situation or another, have had something happen in our lives where it leads to this negative thoughts and these, these negative feelings that start to take us down a negative path. And that path, if not stopped, that's a path towards sin that, if not stopped, leads to something evil. And so God calls Cain to fight, to fight against it. If we were with us last week, we talked about this, how, how we see in this situation, Cain has been enticed by this event, and he is now one step away from conception. He's been enticed by the event, and he's walking the path that leads towards conception. As we learned last week, if you walk towards the path of conception, conception gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. That is why God says to him, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. Do not go from enticement to conception. Sin is crouching there. It wants to have you. Will it master you, or will you master it? And this phrase of sin is crouching at your door actually comes from a, like, like, a, like an ancient Babylonian phrase. Where there was this belief that evil, an evil demon would linger around doorways of buildings, threatening those who would pass through. And that's sort of the reference that's happening here, is you haven't crossed the threshold yet, Cain, but man, you're, you're toeing the line. You need to choose, you need to fight, you need to decide, am I going to continue down this path, then cross the threshold and allow that to pounce on me, or am I going to... Go the other direction, the other option. Am I going to do what is right? Am I going to get back into right relationship with God and with my brother? God calls him to examine the state of his heart and to make a choice before it's too late. But despite God's warning, Cain does step over the line. If you know the story, you know he steps over the line. And he does allow sin to rule him. In verse 8, now Cain says to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And while they're there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Enticement led to the conception of a plan. The plan led to sin, and the sin led to death of a brother. It's a 
first murder ever created, motivated by the sin of anger, of jealousy, and malice. And as God did with Adam and Eve, he, he comes to Cain asking one of his questions to give opportunity for him to confess. And this is how that goes in verse 9. Then the Lord came to Cain and said, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? That's where the question comes from. See, Adam and Eve reluctantly confessed when God came to them. But there was evidence in their confession that they had remorse and repentance. You don't get that with Cain. With Cain, you don't get the sense of that at all. All that you really get is this display of callous indifference. What? Am I my brother's keeper? This word keeper, it's the same word that's used of Adam when he was put in charge of the Garden of Eden. The responsibility to tend for it. To care for the entire creation. To be a steward, a good steward of all that he'd been put into care of. To preserve life within the garden. To be a keeper of all things put under him and entrusted to him. That's what it means to be a keeper. But Cain completely disregarded this responsibility to watch over, to protect, to preserve and save the life of his brother. And instead he has a response that can also be interpreted a little more literally as, why is Abel my problem? Why is my brother, maybe even for us today, why is my sister, why are they my problem? You see, his attitude doesn't really sit well with us, does it? And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Because not only is Cain responsible for doing harm to his brother, but he seems to care so little for his brother's life, for the life of another person in which he, which he dwells and lives and shares a community with. And that's an issue of the heart. You see, there might be some actions that took place that did harm to another person, but really it boils down to an issue of the heart, doesn't it? Why should I care about my brother or sister? That's a question of the heart, not a question of action. You see, Cain doesn't have a heart for his brother. And so this is a question, this is the background of the question, but it's one that I want us to ponder a little bit today as well, as we, as we consider our own relationships within, within the church community, but within the community at large as well. And under, understand, how do we answer that question? Are we our brother and sister's keepers? You see, if you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus Christ, your answer should be fairly quick. It should quickly be a yes. Yes, I, I, I am my brother's keeper. Yes, I know I'm called to be my sister's keeper. And we can come to a quick yes, really based upon the teaching, the example of Jesus himself. Like just a very brief summary of a couple of them. We know that Jesus, as the son of Mary and Joseph, had a number of other brothers and sisters. But he had a larger view of what those terms meant. You see, there's this time in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus was teaching the multitudes in, in, in the area of a house. And his family was getting concerned with some of the things that he was saying. And they were concerned for him and his reputation and for the reputation of the family. And so they, they come to take Jesus away. And they, they're concerned and want to take him home with them. And so some people come to Jesus and say, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. They want to talk to you. And, and he says in, in Luke chapter 8, he says, well, my mother and my brothers, and my sisters for that matter, are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. You see, this is where we get the concept of being brothers and sisters in Christ. Where we become brothers and sisters in Christ because we have this special bond, this special unity that binds us together and being followers and believers of Jesus Christ, being children of God together, brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and sometimes if you hear the word brotherly love, which which comes from the, the Greek word for love, phileo. This idea of brotherly love, this special unity, the special bond that exists between those who are united in Christ. Uh, but then on top of that, we can look just a couple, couple of verses ahead in, in Luke chapter 10, where, where Jesus wants to add to this. He wants to correct anybody who thinks that therefore our, our care and concern for people is limited to those who are insiders. Limited to those who are just brothers and sisters in Christ. And in Luke 10, we get the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this Good Samaritan where Jesus, really, the, the summary point of this, we're going to look at this in a couple weeks in more detail, but, but comes to help us understand, as Jesus tells his followers, that they are to actively care about all people that they encounter who are in need. It, it doesn't matter what they believe, what they look like, how they, how they dress, how they vote. They, 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 those things don't matter. If they're in need, we serve them, we care for them, we love them. See, based upon this, I think you would agree with me that if we consider ourselves to be followers of Christ, that yes, we are to be our keepers, keepers of our brothers and sisters. And I believe that many here don't intentionally mean to harm others. 
We want to show this brotherly love. We, we want to be known as people who share words and actions of, of love to the world around us in hopes that it will lead people towards understanding a deeper walk with Jesus. But isn't it true, though, that every day we, we come into contact with and we walk by or we rub shoulders with people that we're tempted to overlook? I'm probably not alone on this, where you've walked by somebody, you're driven by somebody, and you're like, oh, maybe I should have stopped. Oh, it's too late now. Oh, man, if I could do it over again, maybe I would have stopped if I could do it over again. We, we just kind of overlook these people sometimes. Sometimes it's because we don't see them. Sometimes it's because we, we don't want to be inconvenienced from our schedules to, to step into that person's life for a second. Uh, other times we think, man, phew, I don't think I can make a difference. It's the, their situation seems bigger than what I could offer. Yeah, and so one of my prayers for us today is that God would, first of all, give us eyes to see. To see those in the world around us who are in need uh, of somebody to step into their life, even just for a moment. And to maybe tend to them, and to, to care for them, to maybe offer some life into their lives. And also a prayer that we would have courage to step towards our neighbors in that fashion. That we would be known as those who, of words of encouragement we would be known as those who lighten a burden, who, who lighten a load. That we'd be known to those who bring moments of grace and peace into people's lives. And by doing this, we can bring life into people's lives. See, because in those, we can actually share a taste of what it means to have new life in Christ by doing these things. I believe that Jesus calls people, his people, to be bringers of life and not harm to others. And what that means in terms of how do we bring life and not harm into the lives of our brothers and sisters, be, be keepers of others. I, I just want to spend the rest of the time, the few minutes I have left here today, give you a couple practical examples of ways in which you could do this very thing here in the foyer after church or, or, or in the world you go into throughout the week. And the first example I want to briefly share with you is this one, is that we can be bringers of life and not harm to one another with our words. See, the Bible speaks often about the power of the tongue. It's small in size, but great in power. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and the power of death. Those who love it will eat of its fruits. We can probably all recall times from our lives where we have memories, these powerful memories of words that were shared with us that built us up. A, a, a parent, a teacher, a coach, somebody who, who invested in us and built us up with their words. We also can think of times when people tore us down. And it stung and it hurt when they tore us down with their words. And I, I remember the story I came across a while ago of, of Albert Einstein when he was teaching once he, in the classroom. He, he went to the blackboard and, and he wrote the nine times tables on the blackboard. You know, nine times one equals nine. And nine times two equals 18. And nine times three equals 27. All, all, all the way down to nine times ten. And he wrote equals 91. The classroom turned to the silent murmuring into chaos all of a sudden because one of the smartest men who's ever existed got nine times ten wrong on the blackboard. And they're laughing at him. And he just stood there and waited for them to quiet down. And once they quieted down, he said this. He said, nobody noticed, but I correctly answered nine out of ten questions. But no one congratulated me on those. But when I got one wrong, everyone started laughing at me. Everyone started laughing at me. And he says, and this is the lesson for us today. Even if a person is successful, society will notice the smallest, simplest mistake, and they will enjoy it. Isn't that how it works sometimes? Isn't that what feeds some of the harmful words that happens at times? That one little mistake, overlooking the nine things that went well. You see, words in this manner can steal life. And they can do harm. And you know this when it happens to a person because you can see their whole demeanor just shrink. Their shoulders drop and their, their head drops. And there's just something about them that just starts to die inside. Oh, but folks, let us be people who not only profess Jesus Christ, but let us also be people who are not known for harmful words, but rather for words that speak truth, but speak truth in love, that correct a brother and sister in love that offer encouraging words, that bring hope to those who are lost. Let us be those types of people who, who, who do not steal from life from others, but bring life to others. 
How do we do that? We can do it by, by avoiding certain words. If, if you feel tempted to find yourself in a situation of gossip or slander that would harm another person's character or reputation, step back and say no. Don't walk down that path. You've probably heard the saying before, see something, say something, has to do with like terrorism and stuff like that. But let's apply this to using good words as well. If you see something worth affirming, say something. If you see something worth encouraging, encourage that person. A mom with an upset child in the store, a clerk who's been treated poorly by the previous customer, somebody who got poor results on a test in the classroom, somebody who's struggling at work. If you see an opportunity to encourage somebody, let's be encouragers. If you see somebody who is struggling, let's step forward and bring hope. Let's bring life into people with our words. If you see somebody who is doing well and who is going through a moment of victory, congratulate them. Don't feel resentment and step back and go, I wish I could have had that. No, congratulate them and celebrate with them. And if there's somebody in your life that you care deeply for and you have not shared the words, I love you for a while, let today be that day. Let today be the day where you fill that void and go to that person and then simply say, I love you. Let today be the day you share those words. And never forget this final one. Never forget the power of the words of your testimony. Share with somebody the difference that Jesus has made in your life. To share that hope with somebody, the hope of Jesus with somebody, and allow the Holy Spirit to be the power behind those words. Because our words have power. They do. Our words have power because they reveal our hearts, our hearts for or our hearts against our brothers and sisters. Let us use our words to bring life and not harm to all that we encounter. Amen? Well, there's one other way we can do this as well. We can also bring life and not harm to others through our actions. Galatians 2.9 says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at a proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And this last week I heard a heartbreaking story of a single mother who is struggling right now with three different types of breast cancer. Oh, I can't imagine the difficulty and the fear and the sorrow that would be going through her thoughts in life. You know, words of encouragement, words of love are very appropriate and helpful and important for this lady. But boy, we got to move from words to example. we got to move from words to action as needed in this case as well. And, and people around who are doing so, there's people who are driving her to treatments and sitting with her during these times. There's, there's people who are listening and visiting with her. There's, there's people who are getting her kids to the lessons that they need to get to, who are helping to organize schedules and, and these sorts of things. we got to go from words to action sometimes, don't we? And these are, sometimes these big situations are almost easier to move into because the ways that we can act are so so obvious and so apparent, and so absolutely we need to be doing that. But at the same time, never underestimate the power of a small gesture. The power of a small gesture. You know, this past summer, our youth group went out around the Lewis Farms area just doing a day of random acts of kindness to the world. And there are a whole variety of things that they did. They they popped by my house and made uh, made us banana splits right down the driveway. (laughs) Banana splits. It's great. They went out and they handed out flowers, just a single flower to strangers. And and there's this one lady they handed a flower to that was at the library. And, you know, you you do it and you say thank you and you move on. You don't always think too much about afterwards. But later that day on uh, on the West Meadows site, on, on the Google site, if you Google West Meadows and you look at the reviews, her husband left a review of us. And this is what he said. He said, my wife was given a flower as a random act of kindness. You absolutely made her day. She immediately called me, and I could hear the joy in her voice. Amazing. And we now have a wonderful flower thriving in our kitchen. Thank you, and keep it up. Something so simple can really change a person's day. Our youth did that this summer. Now, we don't know what was happening in her life. We don't know what was going on in her particular day. To some degree, we don't need to. We don't need to know. It was a random act of kindness that that God led them to in that moment, and it made a difference, such a big difference. And so, folks, this week, this week as we go out into the world, let us choose to say yes to those moments. Let us choose to say yes to the opportunities to bring life to others through our actions, whether they be large or whether they be small. Just to say yes to opportunities to serve another person. If somebody asks you to volunteer, yes. If you have things that you're in your house and you're doing some spring, or it's fall, fall cleaning at this point, bring donations to the second stories ministry we have here. If you walk across somebody or come across somebody whose head is kept low and he looks like they do not have much, you can give them as small as a smile. Acknowledge that you see them. 
Maybe ask them what their name is so that they actually have an identity, where society often doesn't give people like that. And maybe even a small gift can make a difference. If you have a neighbor that's gone away for a while, maybe rake their leaves for them, move their garbage bins back up off the road for them. If you're at a restaurant and the waiter is stressed and slow because we know that there's staffing shortages in the world all around us, we can give them a gift of patience. We can also give them a nice tip. If you look, you will find opportunities like this. An opportunity to be kind. And sometimes, here's one more, sometimes the kind thing that we can do, the kind act we can do is the very thing that we don't do. For example, we're coming into flu season. <laughs> and so if you're sick, stay home. Whether it's COVID or a flu or a cold, sometimes the most caring thing you can do during the sick time is stay home. Most of us here are healthy, but we also have those amongst us who are elderly, who have compromises to their health, who are just finishing cancer treatments. We can care for them by staying home if we're sick. West Meadows at Home is always there. You can join us online and you can do an act of kindness through those sorts of things. You see, may we bring life and not harm to others with actions that accompany our words that bring life. And then I got one last one for you. Third way that we can bring life to others. This is maybe the hardest one for some people at certain times. But that's to extend forgiveness to another person. Colossians 3.13 says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Ah, uh, so there's there's such a thing, and we see the thing in this verse is that there's an assumption that we're going to wrong each other along the way sometimes. That that sometimes people will harm one another, and we know when that happens, what ends up taking place is it, all of a sudden there's like this this division that happens. There's this. Moving towards isolation, this growing of bitterness and resentment, which, which might sound kind of similar to what was happening within Cain from that step from enticement to conception. But here, the first words here are bear with, which to some degree can be synonymous with this idea of being keepers of, being keepers, tenders to, fixer uppers, people who care for the relationship who care for others, who want to preserve life of the relationship that exists, to, to bear with one another when offenses take place. And I don't know where this looks like in your life and now or in a season in the past or maybe tomorrow, but, but maybe it's a falling out with a friend, uh, a, a misspoken word or, uh, that, that's led to, to silence or tension within a relationship. Maybe it's a, a betrayal within a marriage. Or, or maybe it's a past act that you committed that you just can't forgive yourself. Whatever the situation may be, it tends to lead to this stalemate of brokenness. And the only way to break that stalemate is through the gracious, life-giving gift of forgiveness. But in order for that stalemate to end, in order for that division to turn back towards each other, to start to bear with each other, not only does it require the gracious, life-giving gift of forgiveness, but it requires somebody to make the first move. It requires somebody to make the first move, which is in part what it means when it says, forgive as God forgave you. You see, our sins were an offense to God. Our sins were something that led to a separation between us and God. In, in essence, there's the, the Bible speaks about how sin leads to death, this, this separation, this relational separation between us and God that we have no ability to, to bridge or to divide or, or to, to solve or repair on ourselves. But God's love... And grace was shown to us while we were still sinners. God made the first move towards us. God made the first move towards us. He sought to bring new life to us. When Jesus took the penalty that we deserved, paid the price for our sins that led to the separation, and in its place offered forgiveness. Paid the price for our sins. Made a way for us to enter into right relationship with God that we could bear with one another in that sense of unity. And all it was left for us to do is to simply acknowledge our need of that. To acknowledge that there is a divide, a gap that exists in our need for a Savior. To believe that Jesus, his gift was sufficient to pay the price to bridge the gap. And then to confess our sin. And say thank you for making the first move. Thank you for paying the price that I could not. Thank you for giving your life that I may have life. Forgiveness is so powerful. 
It's so powerful. Forgiveness brings life to others, and it brings life to us. So I encourage you, maybe I even challenge you today, that if there is somebody in your life that you have been withholding forgiveness from, if there's somebody in your life where you know that, that there's a, a, a divide, a, some sort of chasm that exists and nobody's moving, the stalemate exists, can, can I encourage you? Can I, can I challenge you to make that first move? Because here's the thing about forgiveness. It's, forgiveness is not saying that whatever took place is okay. Forgiveness is not saying that it doesn't matter or that it's acceptable. Forgiveness is saying that I am choosing to let go of this for my sake, for your sake, and I'm moving forward in freedom. I encourage you to make that first move. Because when we have received new life through Jesus Christ, through the forgiveness made possible through Jesus Christ, it brings life to us and equips us to bring life to others through our words, through our actions, and through forgiveness. Amen? See, these are the themes that we reflect upon when we come towards the communion table, as we have an opportunity to do so today. As the worship team comes and joins me back on the platform here, I just want to point out what I mean by that very briefly. You see, when we come to the communion table, we remember that by our faith in the gracious, life-giving words of Jesus, where he promised that one day he would send a Savior who would free us from sin, That his words went to action where Jesus came and sacrificed himself upon the cross, which then led to the opportunity to have forgiveness given to us. When we come to the table, we remember that sacrifice and the impact it has upon our lives. But as we remember the impact and the transformation that happened in us because we we, we acknowledged our need and we believed that Christ was sufficient and we confessed our sins and received him, when when we acknowledge that and we understand the transformation that takes place within us, It doesn't just simply become a vertical relationship and a vertical experience. We then come to the communion table. And the reason it's called communion is because it happens in community. As we commune with God, but we commune with one another as well. And so each time we approach the table, yes, we need to absolutely reflect upon God's sacrificing gift to us. But at the same time, we need to have our hearts drawn to consider our relationship amongst one another as well as we gather to this table. There's an opportunity for us to consider, are we harboring any resentment? Are we harboring any, any anger in our hearts? Is there any ill will that we have towards a brother and a sister? In 1 Corinthians 11, it says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the, cup, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examine themselves to ensure that we are focused upon the sacrifice of Christ. But also, knowing the significance of that sacrifice, examine ourselves and put it into practice. To say, is there a place where I need to do a better job of bearing with my brother? I need to bear up with my sister. I need to offer forgiveness that's been withhold. I need to get into right relationship, into right community with them so we can commune together around the table. These are the things for us to reflect upon as we come towards the table. We think about the harm that is sometimes committed, but the life that this symbolizes. The life with God and life amongst one another. So before we partake of these elements today in response to to our worship and to today's message, before we partake of these elements, I want to invite you to reflect upon these things, to pray about these things, and to examine your heart. And then after a moment, Pastor Andrew will come, and he'll lead us in the taking of these elements. As we come out of a moment of reflection, 
May we approach this table with, with hearts wholly focused on God and the sacrifice that he has provided for us. We encourage those that haven't made a profession of faith towards Christ to, to withstand, to stay away from the table as this is a moment for those that have invited Christ into their heart to remember the sacrifice that he has done for them. If today is the day that you make that decision, we welcome you at this table. You are part of the family, and we encourage you to partake. But on that night, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You join me in a quick moment of prayer prior to taking the cup. God, we thank you for, for your body that was offered that, that bore our sin that was broken for us. And God, we also come before you recognizing the cleansing that your blood offers for us, the right relationship that can be restored through that. And God, as we we take these elements, we thank you for that sacrifice, for the ability to come before you and receive that forgiveness that you freely give. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Take and drink. And after this, this is what is said. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As a worship team leads us in a song now. I encourage you to take this time to either remain seated and and stay in that moment of reflection and remembrance or feel free to, to stand and sing with us as well. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We'll live for you.
in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for that understanding that you are that firm foundation, the one that we can turn to and see modeled for us right words, right action, and right forgiveness. May we go into this week with that understanding that we can look to you in all those times where we don't know, and you will guide us towards your glory. Praise these things in your holy name. Amen. A couple things before we head out today. We are still collecting the benevolent offering, and we are designating that towards the mustard seed. So that's towards Thanksgiving meals. So if you have the ability to give above and beyond your regular giving, we encourage you to do that, and that is where those funds will go. But also, again, newcomer's lunch. Find anybody with a lanyard that I said before the service I would wear and I don't have. Uh, but anybody with a lanyard, and they will guide you towards the youth room. It's kind of a few turns, and our building's a weird U shape. So uh, <laughs> they will guide you towards the back room where the newcomer's lunch Discover West Meadows will be happening. Go in peace. If you took that first step with Jesus today, or if there's something inside you that's desiring to know more about him, our chat hosts are still online, ready to talk with you. Simply click the pray button and one of them will reach out right now. Or you can contact one of the pastors in the church office in the week ahead. As we're now also entering into the fall season, I want to encourage you to take advantage of the many weekly opportunities for you to further connect and grow in your relationship with God and with the people of West Meadows. There's many groups, many events that are now available for you to participate in, where you can make friends, ask questions, learn in a small group environment, serve, or use your talents 
for the betterment of the church community and our surrounding community. To learn more about these, simply hit the subscribe button or the contact us button directly above me right now. And if there's anything we can ever do to support you, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next week, may the grace, truth, and love of Jesus Christ encourage your heart and guide you on how you can invite others to experience new life with Jesus.